The day that Reva fell off the horse, it was morning time, she was with me on the small holding. And um, I had a track on the outskirts of the, of the house. And Reva was trotting around. The horse either bucked with her, she went over. And I, I just heard the scream. Daddy! Ran outside and I'd seen what had happened, but I didn't realise how bad it was. I had a man working for me, an ex-jockey. I went down there, we phoned for the ambulance, ambulance didn't uh, turn up. And I said, Yanni, bring the car around to the road. I'm gonna pick Reva up and take her to the road and we must go off to the doctor, but move, my man, move. Help! I felt hopeless, I wanted to take her to the hospital. I, was, I had my fingers in her mouth to help her try to breathe. I had my hand on her hip, I was trying to stop the bleeding. I was there with three I was like trying to talk to her and she was gurgling and this and that, so I thought the worst of the whole situation. Anyway, Yanni arrived there, I picked Reva up, got into the back of the car. I had her, I had her head on my, on my left shoulder and I could, um, I could feel the blood was running down on me. Um, at uh, at some point, she I heard her breathing. See that her arm was broken, and we drove off to the doctor, which was like 15 kilometres away. Not intent to kill Riva, my lady, or anybody else, for that matter. There's no winners in this. June and Barry lost their daughter. Oscar's family, they had also suffered a loss. We drove off to the doctor, which was like 15 kilometers away. We arrived there, they knew that we were coming. And by the time we arrived there, the ambulance was there, the doctors were there, and that, but we took her to the doctor first. Yeah, that is what happened, and uh, she was rushed off to hospital. And I phoned June to explain to her what had actually happened here. It was actually a horse that was too fresh. It hadn't been worked. It was a racehorse and it was too fresh. Yeah, but she wanted to ride the horse. And no, I know she would have yeah. been okay if she hadn't had an, if the horse hadn't just taken taken off with her, you know. But she, uh, it was the worry of her 
being in a wheelchair for the rest of her life because they didn't know if she was going to walk again. One, relax. They would only know when she got to the point of standing up. I squeeze my finger. This is from the neck because of the spinal shock. Squeeze that. So we're testing muscle strength here, OK? So they didn't know straight away that she's going to be OK. Well done. You're doing brilliantly. A lot of courage there. But I mean, she could never ride a horse again. Up, slowly. Again, I have to catch you. Her back was broken in two places. One more slowly, catch your breath, OK? A little bit and down. Excellent. And then she had to walk at varsity with a, with a, a thing that they made for her, like a support for her. Mm, and the neck. And the neck. No, not the neck. The neck they only do in the bed. Slowly, lift up slowly, and hands slowly come up. This is a little bit of a core. A little bit. And how was her recovery? What? what? No, it took a long time. Yeah, it took a long time, but amazing. It is slowly increases speed. While Reva was learning to walk again, Oscar was learning to run on his blades. Oh, okay, like yeah. No fear, I believe. Let's push to push to the barrier. Push. My brother Thomas and I uh, authored four books. Uh, the first book was on the murder of Inga Lotz, called Bloody Lies. The second book was called uh, Bloody Lies 2, and it was just a follow-up in the first book. Uh, the third book we wrote was uh, called Oscar vs. the Truth, and it's about the killing of uh, Riva Steenkamp. And then the fourth book we wrote was called The Bloody Bride, and it was about the killing of Annie Devani. This is uh, it's called Oscar vs. the Truth. Uh, um, I, I read the book, but I didn't complete it. We wanted everyone to read this book and to understand what happened and to understand what we believe are the truth and what we've proven to be the truth. The most of the stuff in this book, I disagree with it totally. And that's why I didn't complete reading the book. It should be called Oscar versus the untruth. Well, truth, I suppose, is the central to finding justice, uh, where somebody has been wronged. If you're going to hold them to account, you need to uncover the truth of what it is that they've done wrong. Uh, and it is on, based on those truths that you would ultimately find a person guilty of the, the wrong uh, and sentence them accordingly. Thomas got drawn to the Riva case because he saw in the Riva case a lot of what he saw happening in the Inga Lodge case. Uh, the, the shenanigans that went on in the courtroom, the mistakes, the lies, the poor investigations, the poor prosecution, the questionable defense tactics and strategies. And those were the things that infuriated him in the Inga Lodge case and similarly infuriated him in, in this case. And he just felt compelled to use his skills and his talents to pursue truth and to uh, expose injustice in the same way he did in the Inga Lodge case. From the family side, um, the late Reva Steenkamp's family, who obviously would want some closure and finality, and also the people that were following Oscar Pistorius, his own family, as well as uh, all his supporters and all his fans, I think has just kept the public attention and has kept them riveted. Everybody wants to see at the end of the day what was the real story, what was the real position, notwithstanding the fact that he was eventually found guilty. It was reversed on appeal by the Supreme Court of Appeal, a full bench of five judges, and then a sentence was then imposed in regards to what had happened and what the outcome and what the offence was. So it's going to keep the public riveted forever because they followed this from the beginning. Everybody wants to see the end and see some type of finality and closure. River did not get justice. I don't believe that uh, there was, uh, the verdict was not based on the truth. And uh, we have demonstrated that through our work and as documented in the book that we wrote, uh, Oscar versus the truth, is that the verdict is based on lies. It was a miscarriage of justice. You know what, I've, I've got my own ideas about whether or Oscar told the truth or not. Um, I think in some respects he protected himself where he wasn't entirely truthful. 
but I think by and large, his version of events, uh, I think it was accepted by the court, and, and I, I actually go along with what the court had found had happened that night, that it was a case of, uh, in his version, a mistaken identity. Well, if Riva screamed, <laughs> then obviously Oscar knew that she was behind the door. And then his, this whole version of intruder is, is, is completely false. And then we have to question what led up to Riva ending up behind the door screaming. Where the hell is it you going, huh? And while they can look at the other evidence uh, that was in, uh, in the house, on, in, in Riva's clothing, on her body, to try and gain an understanding of, of what happened before. And, and it seems like the evidence point towards an argument that turned physical. Uh, that, that Riva was assaulted and that she went into the toilet to find safety and screaming for help to draw attention to her plight. Barry has said for years, we all know that, that he wants to speak to Oscar because he's got certain questions to ask. He is participating 100% in the process of getting ready to attend that victim offender dialogue. The department has gone out of their way as far as I'm concerned to make sure that they have made sure that they've put the necessary measures in place for June and Barry to speak to a psychologist and to prepare them for the dialogue. I'm very worried, you know, because he's got a heart condition. And if he gets too upset, I don't want him to be in that space, but he wants to do this and that's fine. But I know what I am. I'm a very emotional person, very highly strung, and I, there's no knowing what I will do. So I'm just logically thinking it's not for me. Barry, um, how did it go with the meeting with the psychologist? Um, Tanya, yes, it, it, it wasn't a bad meeting. There wasn't anything that um, made a person really feel bad, but there were quite a few things that the experts, like, explained to me. They said, once you go to this, um, this meeting, um, you must understand that you can come out feeling a better person. Is that now the VOD meeting? That's that the VOD about? meeting. You can come out feeling a better person or, and this is just what they don't like, that you could come out feeling a lot worse. So, you know, go in there and expect the worst mm -hmm. and hope that it turns out better. They're trying to set up a a little mock meeting. June must write down questions, give it to you or to Adele to put forward any question and the same for me. And okay. they just want to give me the feeling of what could be transpire and happen. And your emotional state, Barry? Oh, my lovey. What can you say? He's always been emotional. If you saw him at the court when he gave his, when he gave his evidence or what he, how he felt, it was tragic, it was terrible. We know for a fact you had no reason to shoot. That's Not objectively seen. Yeah. That's correct, my lady. Harry Nell was certainly a very uh, aggressive cross-examiner and, and he went after Oscar very hard. You are lying. But there were aspects of the, of the evidence that wasn't well understood even by him. I obtained 
everything I could. He, as the prosecutor, can always request further statements from, say, X, Y, and Z, or whatever. And so he was satisfied with what we gave him. Your version is so improbable that nobody would ever think it's reasonably possibly true. It's so improbable. I have never worked with a person doing so many pre-consultations um, with witnesses and preparations. Um, he really, there were some days I just said, you know, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> this is like nine o'clock on a Sunday evening, I'm going. So yeah, his preparation was quite thorough. Specifically, the acoustics and the sequence of sounds and gunshots and bat strikes it, uh, that happened that morning. And, and that is what led to actually a lot of his, what he was pushing for being rejected by the court. It's become clear that the timeline of the shooting and evidence of the screaming heard by witnesses is central to this case. I don't think any of those witnesses had any reason to lie. So yes, um, credible people, absolutely. But do remember, no witness will ever see this exact same thing or hear the exact same thing as the other person. Even though it happens right in front of 10 people, you'll have, well, you have the same version, but you're gonna have discrepancies in those versions. Absolutely, yes. The first thing we did was to, uh, to look at the report produced by the defense's acoustic uh, expert. And we found this report to be uh, very biased so we decided to, to start from scratch uh, to do, first of all, uh, a comprehensive research into how loud a woman can scream and the propagation of sound through windows and the fraction of sound. And we end up using a, a, a model where we can actually model how the sound waves would propagate and how it would bounce against other buildings and actually view the contours of how loud the sound levels would be at different places. My point is this. Um, if you are a witness and you give me a version and you give that under oath, I will take it down under oath. Whether it's the truth or not, um, that's supposed to be tested by the court. Moments before the gunshots, I sat in the bed and it's the most helpless feeling I've ever had in my life. I anticipated something was going to happen. Because of the, the climax of her shouts, I knew something terrible was happening in that house. I, was think, I thought they were being attacked in their house. You only shout like that if your life is really threatened. So a lot of people heard noises coming from Oscar's house uh, that uh, that morning. What was that? Did you hear that? What was that? And of all those people, the steps were in the acoustically superior position to hear what was going on there. They were only 72 meters away, across an open plot, perpendicular direct line of sight. And when Mrs. Stipp heard the first sounds, uh, what we believe to be the bat strikes, she was awake and alert. Did you hear that? Moment later, she and her husband were standing outside on the balcony, looking towards Oscar's house, saw a light on, and they heard the frantic, petrifying screams of a woman. <gasps> That's definitely a woman's scream. They also heard some male voices. Uh, so they could, they could actually distinguish a female voice and, and a male voice. It's one thing for one person to perhaps make a mistake, but for four people to do it, it, it just really defies logic that the testimony was uh, rejected. What we know about screaming and the difference between male screams and uh, and female screams, having proven that these sounds would have been audible and intelligible, it, it is my firm belief and conviction that they were correct in that they heard a, a woman scream. It was rejected because the defense managed to present the court a reasonable timeline of events. They could explain the first sounds, and they could explain the second sounds, and the judge thought that everything fitted very well. And for her to accept that sequence of events that the defense presented, 
and which the state couldn't really counter because the state had no idea how to work it all out in terms of first sounds and second sounds. So for a court to accept the defense's timeline, which it did, it had to reject the, the testimonies of the ear witnesses. Riva had gone to Johannesburg with the Avon, the face of Avon she won, and then she went to Ice Models in Joburg, and she did very well with them. Coming from PE uh, is a different than growing up in Joburg. So I think if you from a small, small coastal town, coming to Joburg, everyone sees it as lights. This is like, we, we, most of us think of New York. Oh, we're gonna go to New York, or we're gonna go to Hollywood and um, make it there. So I think Joburg in that regard is where the models aim for to go. She was happy there, but we always worried about her there. It was like, we worried it. I tremendous. always warned her. I just think maybe she wanted to pursue something that she had her eye on. Um, she studied to be a lawyer. And I think once she, she's overcome that hurdle, she wanted to pursue something like modeling. I didn't really like the idea of Riva going to um, Gauteng. Um, it always worried me that you either you don't say the wrong element or whatever it is, but it's so easy to be distracted there by different people. Riva would talk about her parents. She loved them. It's not always easy to make ends meet, especially when you're older and um, in in the line of business that they were in. She was a she was a good girl, so she was open to say, "Listen, I'm doing this shoot for." Um, a range of taps, for instance, and that would help my parents for to pay their medical aid type of thing. You've got to realise that there were a couple of people that heard sounds in that house that morning. Mrs. Van der Merwe testified that between two o'clock and three o'clock she heard sounds of an argument. Was easy intermittent, it bothered her. She even tried to put a pillow over her head, trying to get some rest and sleep. So, yes, there were sounds of an argument heard at the time when Oscar said he was asleep, which was obviously points to him not being truthful about his version. So there's the sounds of, a, of an argument, but then if you start looking at the physical evidence in the house, you get more evidence and signs of, a, of an argument that has taken place. <laughs> but Thomas was certainly a very creative investigator, uh, and he always believed that everything needs to be tested. And for that, he conducted very uh, many different experiments, um, mostly within his apartment. Uh, he once bought a a litter of uh, blood from an abattoir, which he used in, in some of his experiments. And uh, my mother, or he emailed me the one time and said, uh, my mother uh, thinks I must be crazy because there's blood all over the kitchen floor and props all over the house. And, and I can imagine my, my mother wasn't very really pleased to see all this blood around. And there was a, another time when he was hitting a door uh, with, with a cricket bat, and my mother wasn't there at the time, and, uh, and, and she came in and said, like, is everything okay, is everything okay? And, uh, and uh, we know that Thomas was just, uh, I call him the crazy mullet, because uh, he was just out there, creative, passionate about what he was doing, and, and even his daughter knew what, what her father was all about, and that, and that uh, she was just there for him and supporting him, and just knew that, uh, her father was just following his passions and, and doing the best he can for the right cause. Sadly, Thomas Mollett would never be interviewed for this documentary because he took his own life on the 5th of November, 2021. However, what follows are voice messages of Thomas Mollett's opinion of what happened based on his analysis of the evidence. 
once the sky is tested, I think that is uh, pretty much the approach in our book as well uh, to, to say this, this case wasn't tested properly. It was not all evidence was, was presented. Our problem is that Oscar was never asked about that pellet hole, let's call it a pellet hole, uh, the damage on the bedroom door that it looks like a bad, bad blows, and then also the broken door at the, at the bottom, and then also the dented steel plate. So Oscar was not asked about that, so that, that's very important. The bedroom door show quite a few things. Uh, it shows some cracking at the bottom where we're at the floor lock. There's some dents on the side on the edge of the door, and there's also a small little hole in it. Uh, very consistent with a, a pellet gun shot, and, and in this particular case, the bullet or the pellet would have originated from inside the bedroom and have gone in the direction of, of the little sitting room outside the bedroom. Now, Oscar was never asked under what circumstances and when did this bullet hole appear in the door. He was asked about the damage around the floor lock, and he came up with an explanation that because he was in a hurry to carry Reva out after he ran downstairs to open the front door, he just decided to shoulder this door open. And after he got that explanation, the state just accepted and, and, and moved on. In terms of the size of the hole, it's consistent with a pellet. I think it's 4.5 millimeters. And it's also consistent with the interim wound in inverted commas. On the one side and the other side, you'll get a, a splinter off. You can see that's the, the exit. From that, you can deduce that the projectile traveled from inside the room towards outside. Another interesting thing we found was a, a hole at the back of her arm which for some reason uh, was not mentioned or analyzed in the autopsy report. It's a penetrative wound, so something penetrated is roughly round in shape. Various instances of a hole which is consistent with uh, a pellet. So River was seen arriving uh, uh, that evening wearing a, uh, a black uh, sleeveless vest. Uh, her body was found wearing this vest with a whole bunch of holes in it. These holes were caused by ripping. It wasn't caused by shrapnel. Yeah, the holes don't align with any of the abrasions and wounds on River's body. So what we believe happened is that they were made when the vest was gripped and pulled against strong resistance. And also in that same motion, the vest moved across the nipple and, and, and caused that abrasion and, and, the, and the stripping of skin. During that event, uh, the vest must have been pulled completely off because there's evidence that River wasn't wearing a vest at the time she was shot. So the very first gunshot was to her hip and you can actually see a hole in the pants where the, where the bullet entered. But there's no such hole in the vest. We can prove convincingly that the vest at least was put on afterwards and that she was, by all accounts, uh, her upper body was naked. Uh, she probably had the shorts on. Younger women wear this type of thing where it doesn't cover the whole top of the body. There would have been no bullet hole in that vest because it was not in the way of the bullet. So Oscar claimed that he was on his stumps when he shot through the door, and we're not disputing that. Then he claims that later on he put on his prosthesis and then he went back and he tried to kick the door open and tried to shoulder it open. He wasn't successful in doing that. So he went to fetch a cricket bat, cracked the door, ripped the panels out, bent over the door, pulled out the key, opened the door, pulled River's body out. Uh, then he ran downstairs to open the outside door, came back up again, picked River's body up and carried it down. All of this was, on his version, done on his prosthesis. I just want to say here, uh, that is my opinion, as well as the state's ballistics expert, that when the door was broken down, he definitely was on his prosthesis. One would expect to see some footprints, and there are no footprints. One would expect to see blood in his socks, there are no blood in his socks. It also bothered me 
not seeing any footprint in blood or with blood. It's a bit strange to me as well. But what we do see are drag marks. We even see the same marks down on, on the staircase, close to where we, uh, River's body was found later when the police came. So this mark show movement, shows consistency, shows a dimension which is very, that can be reconciled with the dimensions of his stumps. It seems to indicate to us that he never put on his prothesis before he tried to break open a door. He wasn't on his prothesis when he removed a river from, from the toilet and when he ran down to open a door. And uh, this is another facet of his uh, vision that is it's, it's no basis in truth. You're proud parents. Very proud. Very proud. She was the most amazing person. So kind and loving and Christian. And she was very precious. When she was 12, she could socialize with adults and try and help them with their life. That's how she was. For her age, she was amazing. I became the child and she became the parent. That's how she was with us. She'd come visit us and when uh, later on she would come visit us and give us chores to do, you know, in the home when she left the home. She gave us little papers when she left of instructions, what we had to do. That's how she was. She was, t she was an old soul, so she knew much more than we did. A very old soul. She was the boss, the boss. She's a Leo, you know, they're the boss. Reva was pretty much like a, a very nice mother to the younger models as well. And she would, say, once she actually said to someone who said, oh, I don't know, it was a bikini shoot. And she said, well, models should always be prepared. And that's who Reva was. She was outspoken. Um, she would stand up for anyone and she was very nurturing at the same time. So Reva always looked out for the underdog. She, it was just her natural personality. I agree with it. She was like that. But she didn't give me any problems or anything like that. Um, she was more on the mother's side. The mother was the daughter, but I was still the father. You know? You like to think that. You do like to think that, Barry, but I don't think it's totally true. <laughs> A couple getting together again because the child brought them together, in my world, will show a certain dynamic. That the child in that relationship played a certain role. That a child maybe should not play. That it becomes the caretaker or the caregiver to the relational space. And maybe it became a strange codependent relationship where those parents relied on the child to be a mediator or a peacemaker or a harmony bringer and to please or to make her happy, um, they would do that. Maybe that couple was unable to do it by themselves and it became that child's role to do that. And maybe that can be one of the, the dynamics. Well, the marks in Reva's body, there are two uh, abrasions on, the, on her back, which clearly show that she was in contact with an object that moved from top down, slightly from the left to the right. There is just no explanation for how this, these abrasions came in the back inside the toilet cubicle. This, the state tried to say it was it happened when she uh, fell against a magazine rack. That makes no sense because the direction is all wrong. Our biggest point there is the skin in the wound is pressed downwards. If you follow a magazine rack, the marks are supposed to show a bottom to up directionality. The state tried to say it was made by uh, bullets ricocheting off the back wall and then hit, hitting her. My opinion, as an expert with many years of experience, there would no, be no energy left, very little energy left, after penetrating the skull 
exiting the skull, hitting the wall, cause that damage, go back, hit Riva at the back. From there, ricochet and fell into the toilet. No. So uh, the only conclusion to draw is that he obtained these abrasions outside of the toilet. We looked at this and there is absolutely nothing that excludes the cricket bat as a potential source for making these abrasions. So one must just be careful to say it uh, matches exactly uh, the diameter and an N. Again, it's more about uh, being consistent, but, but again, I can show it convincingly uh, visually, you know, and I think that's, that's pretty much our approach. We make for proposed a scenario where he sort of hit out at the, probably she was running away from him and he sort of lashed out. That question is answered. I think it totally answered that she was not chased into the toilet and hit by a cricket bat. We looked at the rounding of the tip and the, uh, the, the roughness of the tip, and it seems to fit very well with the striations we saw in, in, in these abrasions and in the shape of it. I think in terms of how you put it there, uh, I think it's more, again, a case of the wound being consistent with a uh, type of bat, uh, and it can be shown convincingly. I can't remember exactly what the postmodern, but there were no other assault, uh, indications of assault on a body. That I can definitely say. Because the state would have used it. Absolutely. If it was present, it would have proven your intent so much better. I think a very important question is, was there a fight between Riva and Oscar? Who you are reacting now? You are reacting. We know that there was a, an argument that, that took place before the gunshots. Uh, because Mrs. van der Merwe heard these sounds, she could only have heard these sounds if they uh, were outside of the bedroom, the bathroom, and, and, and the toilet area, past the windows at the direct line of sight to her house. So there must have been an argument, and we believe that Riva, for her own safety, fled into the bedroom, tried to close the door. This door was broken and breached, and that's why we see the damage on the door. And then Riva fled further for her safety and locked herself in, 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 the, in the toilet cubicle and screamed for help. He was consistent in regards to his version put to the witnesses and he was consistent in regards to his evidence in chief. Only when he started being cross-examined as to certain factual issues and certain evidential issues in regards to whether the curtain was open and closed, where was the late Reva at the time you left the bed? Are you sure you're okay, yeah. yeah. Where was your firearm? Um, when did you go down the corridor towards the bathroom? Only when they started unpicking and cross-examination, it was a very, very testing, thorough, and quite an odious cross-examination, then certain gaps and certain discrepancies, inconsistencies, and sometimes contradictions were brought out. And that's really the purpose of cross-examination. If you go and look at what happened that morning, it becomes clear that Oscar already knew, or there was a strong likelihood that he knew what the steps would say. And the reason why we say this is that we know that Dr. Stipp came out of his house and he went over to, uh, to Oscar's house. He actually inspected the uh, uh, River's body and, and said that she was dead. Then afterwards, there was a discussion between Stander, which was a friend of Oscar, and, and Dr. Stipp. And Stander asked Dr. Stipp, what, what did he hear that evening? <gasps> what was that? Did you hear that? Dr. Stipp told him that he heard four shots, silence, he heard screaming, and another four shots. Uh, and that was it. And then uh, Dr. Stipp went back to his house, and soon afterwards, Advocate Kenny Altwager arrived. And Altwager and Stander had a discussion. Stander gave Altwager Dr. Stipp's telephone number. And then afterwards, Stander called Dr. Stipp and said, listen, I gave your phone number to Advocate Altwager, who may call you later. But also, one can, 
with a high degree of probability assume that Steiner would have told Oldwache what Dr. Stubb told him about the first and second sound. And then Oscar said that his bail affidavit was written by his legal representatives, not by himself. All he did was he read it, he agreed with it, he signed it. It, it wasn't even written by him. Yes, he was consistent up and until the cross-examination came out. And when he was cross-examined, all different versions and different accounts of what was basically a very simple version. I was there, it was pre-Valentine, we had our dinner, we went to bed, I heard the noise. Um, I looked, I didn't see Reva, I then got on my stumps. I didn't even put my prosthesis on, took my firearm, which I'm licensed for, and I went to see. And I said to Reva, Reva, quick, pull the call. Call the police or call the security or do something. I didn't have a tear an answer, whatever. I went down the corridor and I thought somebody was in the bathroom. Get out of the house. Get out of the house. And I then fired the shots. Like for most people in this uh, type of situation, uh, for Barry and June Stenkamp to find closure, they need to know the truth. He's the only person who was there in the early hours of the morning. He's the person that um, acted. He's the person that unfortunately pulled the trigger. So only he knows why and what led to it and what the reasons are. I think somewhere in the line, we must come to rest. Get peace of mind. I sincerely believe, and a, a lot of people want to know the truth. They won't necessarily seek retribution and, and, and punishment. They just want to know the truth so they can forgive, close, and move on. He's apologized to the family, but I think you've got to go one step further, and that can only come out between the family and him as to what led to it and what it was all about. Get it over and done. That's my opinion. It, it's hard to say it, I know, I know. It's not easy to do it, but face him and ask him the questions that is in your mind. Let him answer it then. Maybe he can't answer it, maybe he can, but get peace of mind. Yesterday, you know, um, I had to go psychologist. Um, it was just um, to help me or to adv and to advise me on the upcoming um, session that um, I'm going to have with um, Oscar Vistorius. And I asked and I said to her, Tell me, if it was you, what would you do? See, that's a very difficult question, but I'll try and ask. She says, as a professional, she would tell me not to go. And then I said to her, and if it was your daughter, what would you do? She said, then I would go. Reva brought Oscar to the agency and I met him and I thought he was lovely and very down to earth and humble and I think uh, if you learn enough about people you you kind of get blindsided as well um, we can never tell how we're gonna react but I, I thought he was a lovely down-to-earth guy. 